Yep. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. We're using a microphone because we're filming this so that all your friends who missed today's program or stayed away because they don't like sharks <laughs> can tune in on channel 22, and this is where it'll be playing in a few weeks. It'll also be available on the library's website. We film a lot of things, and if you go to myrml.org and look at events, there's a, there are many events that you can watch online. So, uh, before I introduce Greg Metzger, I want to thank, or blame, no, thank Maureen Flanagan, a fan who teaches at the high school who's long been telling me about Greg Metzger, and I've successfully avoided having him here for a few years anyway, but now he's here. <laughs> so, thanks Maureen. Um, Greg has been teaching marine science and aquaculture at the Southampton High School since September 2001. In his 14 years, he's had the opportunity to design and build one of the most state-of-the-art machine labs found in a publicly funded high school in the country. His program educates hundreds of individuals of all ages each year in the area of marine science and the industry of aquaculture. Most recently, Greg and a group of fellow researchers formed the Long Island Shark Collaboration. This team has set out to better understand the population dynamics of all large coastal sharks found along the south shore of Long Island. Yes, if you heard me correctly. Um, in addition, they hope to begin to unlock the mysteries of the young of the year white sharks found in these local waters. He is also an adjunct professor of agriculture at Stony Brook University. Greg holds a master near, has held a master near coastal U.S. Coast Guard license since 2005, and he runs a successful charter business. He has delivered public lectures and conducted workshops, educating citizens on biology of sharks and the scientific method used by shark biologists. Please welcome Greg Pensker. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming out. Uh, I know that time is precious for us, and so for you to take an hour of your day to come and spend it with us, is, I really do appreciate that. Hopefully you'll find that the, the lecture is informative and, and interesting worth your hour. So uh, thank you, Penny, for having me here. Um, you may not like some of the things I'm going to tell you, but it is, it is the truth. And uh, I always follow that up with, there has never been a confirmed shark attack on Long Island as long as Long Island has been here and sharks have been swimming. So um, I don't think you have to worry. So the story of Long Island Shark Collaboration, what, we, what we we're about and what we did st start, started at uh, Southampton's campus uh, owned by Long Island University back in, back in the day. So I always wanted to be a marine scientist, even though I grew up in western New York where I still currently have more cows than people that live in my county. When all my friends wanted to be doctors and lawyers and firemen, I wanted to be a marine scientist. So 11th grade, an opportunity came to uh, do a marine science summer camp for a week down at LIU Southampton and I took advantage of it. It was the first time I ever had a chance to see salt water. And so coming from a very small rural community in western New York, fantastic facility here, right on the water, had everything I needed. Um, and so I was uh, um, uh, accepted and, and came to LIU Southampton at the time. And from there, uh, I graduated with a couple of wild and crazy cats. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to keep in contact over the years. So uh, Chris Paparo is uh, Fish Guy Photos. If you follow Fish Guy Photos or if you know who Chris is, uh, he is sort of our, our resident photographer for the, the Long Island Shark Collaboration. He's also an avid uh, writer, so he's sort of our advertiser. He, he publishes a lot of work that we do and takes pictures of things. He is the, uh, his his full-time job, well this is his full-time job, but his, I guess his job probably that pays the bills, is uh, he's the new marine lab, uh, the new brand new marine science center here in Southampton. He's the lab manager for that facility. Toby Curtis, is uh, he went on to uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, and so he's currently actually in the large coastal sharks um, department there. So, so he's, uh, he's our resident scientist for the Long Island Shark Collaboration. 
And Frank Lovetto, who you may know, is the director of the South Fork Natural History Museum, which is located on Bridgehampton Turnpike. Fantastic facility if you haven't been over there. Um, and so the three of us all graduated together with marine science degrees, and, and clearly we sort of went on to, to different avenues. Um, and, but, but all of us, you know, so for me, I teach marine science now at Southampton High School, and uh, I was an avid fisherman and hunter uh, when I grew up in Western New York, and so I, I was able to transfer that down here, uh, and having summers off, I would I bought a boat, I finally had money, I could afford a boat, so I went and bought a little boat, and went out and we were fluke fishing and forky fishing, and, but then you venture a little farther, and then you hear about sharks, and so well, maybe we can go out and catch some sharks, and so that's what we did, is, is I started to go out and, and catch sharks, and as, as a, I was never into catching them and bringing them back and hanging them up at the dock and that, it was more just for the amazement of, oh my gosh, there's, there's a shark. And, uh, having a marine science background and knowing that there weren't a lot of uh, information known about any of the shark species, I knew that every shark I caught and let go was, was a lost data set for somebody. And so in keeping in contact with these guys and saying, you know, I'm, I'm catching these sharks. Toby is a white shark guy at heart. He's, uh, his PhD, I think, is actually in uh, basking sharks. But um, uh, he did a lot of work on, in California with white sharks. And so that was, that was sort of his, his real passion. Um, and so we knew that there, Long Island, the South Shore of Long Island, back in the 50s and 60s, scientists were, were catching these little white sharks, but nobody was really doing much about it or, or focused on the white sharks because it was kind of a needle in a haystack. If you're getting funded to, to, to do research, you, their, your funder wants to have a, an end product, and studying white sharks on Long Island was kind of a needle in a haystack. But we, you know, we thought, well, you know, might as well try. You never know. Um, so, so that's that's what we started to do, and so we we were we were spent many years kind of just talking about this, like oh, you know, we should really do something, we should really do something. And uh, three years ago now, we stopped talking, and we we actually got our ducks in a row, and we're able to go out. So three years ago now is when uh, we we went out, and well, we decided that we're going to stop talking, where we we were issued our we. we filed for permits to do the work that we did. Um, we got our, our scientific methods, uh, methodology in line for the questions that we wanted to answer. Um, we were able to, through some, some chance interactions, uh, get some tags from the Large Pelagic Research Center, um, was an uh, organization I worked with back in when I was my, in my college days, lost contact with them, reconnected, and, and they had some tags that were available to us. Uh, the gentleman in the middle is Dr. Greg Skomel. If you've watched Shark Week at all, ever, or pretty much seen anything that has to do with the large white sharks here in the Atlantic, all up and down the Atlantic, uh, Dr. Skomel is the one that's in charge of that work. And so he, we're underneath his federal permit. So if we're fishing or doing our work in federal waters, we need to be covered for the federal permit, and we're under his. Toby uh, wrote our state permit, so if we do the work, we're covered, uh, and we will do the work in, in state waters. Uh, Frank, being the director of the South Fork Natural History Museum, uh, this local charismatic project was exactly something he wanted his museum to be a part of. And so rather than just having it be sort of superficial on paper, he really wanted to commit the museum. So he has a, he has a meeting, he says, all right, he says, I need somebody from the museum that's gonna be out on Greg's boat pretty much every day of the summer representing the museum. And there was just about mutiny because like, we are so busy here, there's no way we can give up this time to go out on the water and stuff like that. So Frank's like, what am I gonna do? And so he was so committed that he, he actually found money to create a paid uh, position. So uh, if we work on volunteers, that's what you get as volunteers. It's very easy for them to cancel or this or that, but if it's a paid position, they're gonna show up and they're gonna represent the museum. And so uh, for the last two years, we were able to hire Jessica Quinlan as our, as our intern. And we're happy to say that uh, she's not our intern this year because she's pursuing graduate work in, in shark biology. So uh, we've, we've been fortunate that uh, the, her experiences and skill sets that she's learned here with her own drive um, looks very promising for her to, uh, we're waiting anxiously for the acceptance letter. So, um, so we're super happy that she's not with us this year. And uh, we're, we're excited to meet our new intern and uh, get, get started. Uh, Southampton High School, so that's, that, that's where I come in. Um, for, I teach marine science there. We have a very sophisticated program there. If you haven't had a chance to come and see our marine science lab, I encourage you to do that. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, 
And so this ties in beautifully with our chart work. So I, I bring students out, I'm having permission slips signed as we speak. Uh, and so I, I want to take advantage of, of the opportunities for science to be transferred to my students in, in the classroom. So, uh, so it's, it's a whole bunch of us all sort of working together. And you know, everybody kept saying, well, who are you? What do you call yourself? What is it? And it's like, well, we're listing and listing and listing and listing. And it's like, all right, we got to come up with a name. So we came up with the Long Island Shark Collaboration because it's literally all these different organizations sort of working together and, and pulling on the rope in the same direction. We're not, it's just a name. We don't even have a logo or anything like that. So um, maybe in the future, money starts pouring in like water, uh, we'll have to form an LLC or something like that. So that first year we go out and we, we started uh, to, well I, I had been catching, I, so I had been recreational fishing for sharks for many, many years before, three years ago. Um, so uh, that first year, so I knew that we were going to be catching sharks. Uh, so what are some sharks that you can find here on Long Island? Uh, the most common shark that we've caught so far are blue sharks. Um, to give you, you know, we've, we've caught, uh, that first year we caught 34 blue sharks. Just, uh, we caught, uh, we also catch the short fin mako. So that first year I think we caught around nine short fin makos. Uh, there's one of my favorite sharks, which is the thresher shark. So this, uh, this, this shark is, is, is very interesting for lots of reasons. Um, so if you notice, uh, we, we take two measurements. We take the uh, fork length, which is the straight line from the tip of its nose to the fork of their tail. So most sharks have an upper and a lower lobe to their, to their tail. So we take the fork length, and then we take the total length, which is from the tip of its nose, straight line distance to where the end of the tail is. And what's neat about the thresher shark is if you had, so say this was 100 centimeters from its fork length, its total length would actually be way back here. So this is actually the end. This is the upper lobe of the shark's uh, body. So if you have a 100 centimeter body length, you're going to have a 200 centimeter total length because the upper lobe of their tail is usually about the same uh, length as the, sh the shape of their, their, their body. So they're called fresher sharks because of the way that they work. So what they do is they like to hunt uh, schooling fish. So they'll go into a school of bluefish or a bunker or a squid. And, and so as the shark is swimming around, these schooling fish all up for protection. You know, don't even eat him. So, and what the shark will do is it will swim up to that school very quickly. And you can see they have huge pectoral fins. So the pectoral fins, they use them for multiple things. And one of the things that they use them for is to stop. And so what will happen is the thresher shark will swim up to this school of fish once he's got them really balled up tight, put those big pectoral fins out to put the brakes on, and he'll flip his tail up over his head, thrashing through the school of fish. And what's neat about these thresher sharks is they have tiny little mouths. So if you had a 200-pound white shark next to a 200-pound thresher shark, a 200-pound white shark would have a jaw like this, and a 200-pound thresher shark would have a jaw like this. Because that white shark's got to have big mouths to chase stuff down and take off big hunks. These thresher sharks, they're eating fish or squid that are stunned and are sort of floating away, so they don't need those big teeth. They have very small teeth, little tiny mouths, so they can just suck down those, those small fish. So do you ever have to worry about getting bit by a thresher shark? No, because you don't, unless you look like a bunker or squid, and all those are about this big. You know, they have mouths, these tiny little mouths with these tiny little teeth. So very, very common fish. Two years ago, if you went out with a snapper pole and threw it in the ocean, you would probably catch a thresher shark. They were all over the beach, tremendous, tremendous numbers of them. Last year, we were all geared up to catch thresher sharks. Not a one didn't show up. So we're hopeful, uh, but we did catch a whole bunch of white sharks last year. So we're hoping that the threshers come back strong this year because we are uh, very interested in them and there's not a lot of data known. So neat, very, very neat shark. Another very common shark as the water warms up is the sandbar shark. And a very close looking shark is the dusky shark. And so if you know anybody that's a shark fisherman and they're fishing in the end of July and August, you know, hey, Jimmy, how'd you do? Oh, I caught one of these brown sharks. Brown sharks everywhere. All right, well, was it a dusky or was it a sandbar? Because they're both brown. Ah, most people don't even realize there is a difference. And so, um, it, with, with, without, the easiest way I think that I've kind of found to um, identify, to tell people the difference is just feel the shark. Yes, Penny, I said feel. Yeah, I'm. I'm... You, you've already you tuned out 10 minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> so just feel the shark. 
okay? If the shark feels like a fish, like it's slimy, like it leaves a slime kind of left over, that's a dusky shark. If it feels sort of like sandpaper, it's sort of firm, like sandpaper, if you put sandpaper over your hand and sort of just feel it, that would be a sandbar shark. So uh, there are some others. If, if they're bigger, um, if, you, if, if they're bigger, uh, the sandbar has a very, very large dorsal fin compared to the size of its body. But if they're both small sharks, their dorsal fin is kind of hard to tell the difference. So if you're ever out shark fishing and Jimmy catches a brown shark, you can be like, let me touch it. All right, no, you got a sandbar. Oh, you have a dusky. So. Uh, we also catch some, some pretty oddball ones. So this is the smooth hammerhead. Uh, we see tremendous numbers of smooth hammerhead, what we call finning, on the surface. So again, this is a little warmer water species. So uh, July, August, you go out and on a nice calm day, and you'll just see these fins cutting through the water all over the place, and almost every one of them, for the most part, will be a, 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 a smooth hammerhead. We haven't had a whole lot of success actually catching them. Uh, what we think is happening is when they're at the surf, they, they mostly are feeding what we think down deeper, um, and so they get cold. And so when we see them fitting at the surface, they're warming up. You know, they're, they're kind of lethargic, and just because we can't get them to really take much bait. They don't come, they don't respond to the chump slick, there's nothing. So we don't really know. There's almost nothing known about the, the smooth, smooth hammerhead up here. So once we've answered all the questions on the thresher sharks and white sharks, this will probably move on to these guys. Uh, because it's pretty neat. But you see a lot of them, and if any of you know how to catch them, I would be very interested in, in learning. Uh, real, real neat one, this is, uh, I've only caught one of these. This is a, a small tiger shark. This is not the sand tiger shark that you see um, at the aquarium in Atlantis, the big, the big sharks that swim around in the big aquariums with the teeth that stick out all over the place. That's a sand tiger shark. They are found here on Long Island, um, sand tiger sharks. Uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society is doing a really nice job at learning about the, the uh, movement of these young um, sand tiger sharks in the Great South Bay. Uh, this is the, the true tiger shark. This is the one that, uh, you know, they cut open in jaws and had the license plate in it and, and that. So, so that was, this was a real, this, this shark gets like well over a thousand pounds. And this was just a little teeny guy. So it was pretty exciting to, to have that. So. Um, there's, there's over 20 species of sharks that you can find in our waters over the course of, our, of the year. A lot of them are, are small, but uh, it, it's a really neat place to be. So you know, when you're out shark fishing, um, you really never know what you're going to catch until you can get it alongside the boat close enough to actually get an ID on it. So it's very exciting for us. So that first year, I spent 54 days. I went and fished 54 days. Uh, we had caught 49 sharks. We set the goal at 50 from based on my experience and the number of sharks we caught. I figured, all right, you know, we can probably catch about 50 sharks and put tag. So we fished 54 days. We tagged, we caught 49 sharks, no white sharks, but that's what we were really after. We wanted to see if we could catch these, these little white sharks. It was uh, August 25th, and I start school in like five days. So I'm like, crap, you know, we got. You know, we're just sitting in it for first day, you know, no shark. Another day goes by, no shark. So we've been fishing four days, nothing, not a scrap of sharks. I'm like, A, we're not going to make our goal 50 sharks. B, we're definitely not going to catch a white shark. But we're optimistic, so we're thinking, wow, wouldn't that be great? Cinderella story, number 50 is a white shark. How great would that be? You know, despite all the texts and emails and pictures I'm getting of my students that were out there fishing the same day I was, hey, Mr. Prince, we got a white shark. Hey, Mr. Prince, we got another white shark which was happening. So it was so frustrating that, that last week there were lots of white sharks caught in by me. So at 6 o'clock at night, we're getting ready to leave, and one of the, one of the, the crewmen says, hey, he says, I, I just saw a fin, a shark fin by the back buoy. So I said, okay, great. You know, so the angler gets, he's getting ready, he's getting set up. And uh, here's one minute of that sort of experience, one minute video of that experience. So the angler uh, gets the belt on and gets ready to go. Uh, we... So he was a little bit inexperienced. Ow. Okay, he was a little inexperienced, so I'm coaching him on what happens. The end of August, we get a look at it. He says, okay, it's a small little mango shark based on what we saw until it comes up again, and I saw that its back was brown and not 
brown, uh, blue like a mako. And there's only one shark in our waters that has the profile of a mako shark, but the color brown, and that was a white shark. So as sure as I'm standing here, our 50th shark on that last day was, uh, was a white shark. And so we've got a tail roped here, um, and with Jess, she's getting ready to put a satellite tag in. So with one quick motion, we were the first on this planet to satellite tag uh, young of the year white shark in the Atlantic Ocean. So we literally made history in white shark work with that, with that tag. So despite all the hours that we spent, we spent seven minutes with this little lady. And so we got our pictures, we got her tagged, and you can see she's still quite lively and uh, kicked off pretty pretty strong. So we were super excited because it finally happened. Um, we were pretty sure that, that there wasn't a whole lot of white sharks tagged. These little, so young of the year, you've heard that term, what does that mean? That means it's a shark that's less than one year old. And we know that these sharks are less than one year old because they still have an umbilical scar. I do this with because our belly button, uh, we have our belly button down here. Sharks have their belly button up here. So you can still see their belly button. That, that tells us that that shark was born that year. It's less than one year old. And so all the white sharks that we've tagged these last couple of years have that umbilical scar. Um, so, so when we did some digging, um, we found that, that, that was, we were the first to put an electronic satellite tag uh, on, uh, in, the, in the Atlantic. So that was pretty exciting. So we put the press release out. So here's our little lady the satellite tag uh, right before we let her go. Um, and so we put the press release out telling sort of the world that anybody that was interested in, and so quickly thereafter we get a call from Chris Fisher. This is Chris Fisher. If you know who Chris Fisher is, you should be saying to yourself, holy crap, Chris Fisher called you. And if you don't know who Chris Fisher is, I'm going to explain who he is, and then you can say, holy crap, Chris Fisher called you. Um, so he says, hey guys, he says, you know, I got your press release. He says, you know, we're thinking about coming to the Northeast to, to do some white shark work. Would you be interested in having us uh, come and help you? So we're like, uh, well, uh, let's take, uh, yeah, of course, that would be fantastic to have you come and, and help us. Um, so Chris Fisher is the founder of Bosearch, and again, if you know who that is, Good. If you don't know who that is, I'll, I'm, I'm going to explain it now. So he says, you know, Chris, um, you don't really have to come. So these guys have made a, a very famous, uh, been made very famous by going around the world catching very large white sharks, the largest white sharks, big ones, and we're catching ones that are like this big. So he says, Chris, you know, we're like the biggest sharks we're going to catch are like 80 pounds. Most of them are like 60 pounds. You really don't need probably to bring the whole rig to do the work on these little fish. You know, they're not that big. He says, nope, if we're coming, if we do an expedition, we put it together, we're bringing the whole show. So it's like, okay, you know, great for us. So they have three boats in their fleet. I uh, have one in my fleet. And to just give you an idea as why we were a little concerned, this is the main vessel, the uh, merchant vessel Osearch. It's a 120-some foot long refurbished Alaskan king crab fishing boat with uh, a giant platform that sits here in the middle. So this is hydraulics to run the platform. So what happens is when they catch these sharks, normally they're catching sharks that are well in excess of 1,000 pounds. You, you can't pull that onto your boat. So what happens is this platform lifts up, it goes out over the uh, gunnel of the boat and then lowers itself down into the water, at which point they're able to then uh, have the shark on the line and they pull the shark into the platform and then they raise the platform up to lifting the shark out of the water. It's the first time that scientists have had access to these animals of this size in a safe environment for both them and us. So they uh, oxygenate them, they put hose in their mouths so, and work very quickly. So we said, you know, you really don't need to do this with a six foot shark. But, you know, his, Chris's point was, you know, yeah, but if you're working over the side of your vessel, only one person can be doing one thing at a time. If we put the shark on the platform, we can have three or four people doing three or four things at the same time. So we can get exponential more data in a very quick period of time and get the shark back in the water safely. So it just worked beautifully. Uh, the other two boats that they have, are, uh, they have a contender, I think it's around 30, 30 some foot contender, and then they have their safe boat. So these, these are the three boats that they use to fish. Uh, this is Captain Brett McBride. He's actually leadering one of our little sharks here. Here's the radar tower in Montauk um, uh, along. So, so they came the, the third week, they were here the second and third week in August, and oh boy did we catch sharks. Um, I had fished probably well over 100 days over the last two years. 
uh, and caught one white shark. They showed up and caught uh, eight in about four days. So clearly, you know, they know what they're doing in terms of catching white sharks. This is what they do. But for me, as a recreational fisherman here on Long Island, I can call Jimmy up and say, "Hey, Jimmy, how'd you how'd you catch them white sharks?" You know, like it doesn't exist. You're not. People don't fish for white sharks. So uh, these guys, these were my Jimmy, you know, and they were fantastic in, in being able to tell me what they're doing, what they're using and stuff. So I'm really hopeful that I could take the little tweaks and changes that they provided last year and, and start catching, you know, I want to catch nine this year. Um, so we'll see. Uh, so all the sharks uh, that, uh, two of the sharks, two, uh, two of these um, are most uh, sort of special is uh, Hampton. This one was, was named uh, in recognition and thanks to Southampton High School and the contributions that the high school's given and as well as the community of the Hamptons here for supporting O-Search like they did. And the one that's most special is Manhattan because this was one, they had caught eight, I caught none. I was like, we're going to fish it right there. But uh, Manhattan was actually caught off our vessel. So this was the last fish of the expedition. This was the ninth shark. We caught it and uh, it's, it's very, very cool. So, uh, so those are the two sharks that are most sort of special to, uh, to, to me and the, and the crew here. Uh, you can follow the, the sharks on the O-Search Global Shark Tracker. Uh, if you go to osearch.org, you can follow them. This is what it sort of looks like when you pull it up on, the, on your computer. Uh, each, one of these long or each one of these different colors is a different shark track. Uh, the dots represent what's referred to as a ping. So when the shark's uh, dorsal fin breaks the surface with the tag that we have, and I'm going to get, I'll explain the tags and stuff, I have some of them here. But when the shark's fin, with the, when the tag breaks the surface, um, it works like your cell phone. So we'll get a location and it puts a dot on the map where it is. And then the next time that it pings, uh, the, it's just, as, we don't know necessarily that it went from here to here. It could have gone on like this and then ping, but so that's, that's how you read this. So you can go, it's free and open, which is one of the crazy things about O-Search. Normally scientists and data collectors want to roll themselves until they publish it, but you have access every day to this data just as early as I do. So um, uh, that's, that's how it worked. I, um, this, is, this is today's track of Manhattan. And so what you can do is you can follow, that. this is where he's gone, every ping that we know. And so what's, what's this, this data is, is pretty much unprecedented. We've known since the 50s and 60s that little white sharks hang out on Long Island because scientists and people have been catching them back in the 50s and 60s. But we, that's all we knew. We didn't know, do they hang out here? Are they, how much time do they spend here? Do they come back? Where do they go? We didn't know anything. Well, now that we've got these tags on, we're starting to unlock that, that information. So here's where we tag them in Montauk back in August. Uh, and remember his name's Manhattan? How perfect is that? Look where he hung out. All around Manhattan. And then the end of August, uh, the end of October, he started, made a beeline down, all the way down. And so for the whole winter, he's been hanging out off of the Carolinas. And this is his latest ping. This was May 11th or 14th or something. So we're seeing that Manhattan starting to, to cruise back north. Um, all of this is unprecedented. We, we didn't know, you know, so we are, it is safe to say now that Long Island is a nursery for white sharks. The thing that, the piece that was missing was we had to prove that these sharks hung out here for a period of time and they stayed here for almost two months. We tagged them at the end of uh, October, of August, and they didn't leave till October. So that proves residency. They're, they're not just hit and running, they're hanging out here. Um, I used Manhattan, well, because we caught them. But well, it's also because it's one of the few sharks that we've been getting consistent data out of. Um, if you look at the Global Shark Tracker, we're hearing from all nine sharks, but a lot of them, we're not, because it works like a cell phone, if they don't stay at the surface long enough to get a location, we're not going to get a ping. So as soon as the tag breaks the surface, the satellite will say, ooh, I'm here. And the only way the sharks, we can hear from the sharks is if they're at the surface. Well, if it's the shark is dead, it's not going to be at the surface, we're not going to get pings off them. So we get what's called Z-pings. And it's super frustrating because we're hearing from all nine sharks, but we don't know where they are. We know they're alive, we know they're swimming, but we don't know where they are. So we are getting consistent data from Manhattan. And uh, so hopefully we're in the process of tweaking our technology. We're actually working with the tank manufacturers to, to change the design so that hopefully 
we can get those new sort of tweaked tags out on, on sharks this year and we'll get more consistent data from, from all of them. So uh, we're super excited. Um, and this, this, the technology has allowed us to, to now start to, to get, this, get these answers. So tagging sharks recreationally started back in the 1960s with uh, the Cooperative Shark Tagging Program. So one of the biologists that was in NOAA says, you know what, I know that there's lots of sharks getting caught and released, that's lost data. So let's create bi-recreational fishermen. So let's create a program where we can put tags in their hands so that they can start to, we can start to collect data from these sharks that the fishermen are catching and releasing. So they started this Cooperative Shark Tagging Program back in the, in the 1960s. And this was the, so this is what a tag looks like. Uh, if any of you have ever caught maybe a, a striped bass that has a tag in it, or if any of you are duck hunters and you have a, a banded duck or goose, it's the same same idea. So what this is is just this is just a stainless steel uh, anchor, piece of heavy mono fishing fishing monofilament fishing line, and then this yellow part at the end, which is the tag. And so it has a unique number. So the tag and the card have the same number. And basically, what happens is you catch the shark. You put this tag in the base of its dorsal fin into its body, so it, it's, it stays on the fish permanently. And you take these measurements, or is this information as much best as you can, you let the shark go and swims away. So what that does is it gives us a snapshot of the shark today. We know where it is, we know how big it is, we know what sex it is. Not that they change their sex, but it's important to note that. Um, and we let it go. The data then, the power of this tag, is if and when it gets recaptured. And so here is, here's a picture of a little mako that we tagged, so you can see how the tag looks, okay? The tag at the end is, uh, the end has a screw cap on it, and so if you unscrew that and you pull that out, it has written in like four different languages what to do. So if you're brand new, you don't know anything about tagging or what to, what to do, it tells you in there, please take the length, the width, mail it in, email it, phone calls to this. Um, and so I get a question, well, why is it written in four different languages? Why is it written in four different languages? Yeah, you don't know where they're going to go. So this little mako we tagged uh, in, I think, July, uh, about five miles off the beach here in Long Island. And 18 months later, I get this letter in the mail, congratulations, your shark has been recaptured. Okay, so this is the information that we provided, and this is the information that the fishermen who recaught it gave us. Okay, this is the mid-ocean ridge. If I blow Google image up just a little bit more, the coast of Africa is right here. The shark was recaptured almost 2,000 miles away off the coast of Africa, 18 months later. In that 18 months time, it grew about a foot longer, and it gained about 30 pounds. So that's tremendously valuable information about a mako shark. And so if you multiply that by, they're up to like a couple hundred thousand sharks that have been tagged, you can really start to get an idea as to where, how these sharks travel, what their growth rates are, life, life um, how long they live, all that sort of stuff. So tremendously, tremendously valuable information, very cheap, and they can get it, get it into the hands of anybody that's interested in um, uh, being a part of the tagging program. So if you do catch a striped bass or a banded duck, please make sure you return that data because somebody maybe have been waiting like 10 years for that information to come back. So it's very valuable to return the, return the data. Okay, so great, we got all this information, but there's a lot missing. Where the heck did it go in between for these all this time? Like where, where, where did it go over the 18 months? We got to start and an end, but we don't have anything in the middle. So then you can start to uh, get a little more sophisticated. So this is, uh, this is the next sort of level up in sophistication in terms of tags. This is called an acoustic tag. Uh, this is a real tag, so please be careful with it as you pass it around, but I think it's valuable. That little metal thing that's on it with the tape, that's a, a magnet to keep the tag turned off. So try not to, don't take the magnet. You know, this, this part right here is the magnet that keeps the tag turned off. So just, it shouldn't do anything with it. 
Um, and so what happens is we can, we can uh, anchor these at the base of the dorsal fin like you saw the other tag, or what we can do is we can uh, surgically implant it. So we can put a little incision uh, in its belly wall and then slide the tag inside and it stays in that space between the inside of the belly wall and, and the internal organs. And so what it does is it's an acoustic tag. It produces a radio frequency. And each tag is tuned to its own unique radio frequency. And every couple of seconds, the tag sends out this radio frequency. In order to collect the data, you need a receiver. Okay, so what we would do is, this is, this is the receiver. Um, and what this does is this, we place these out into the ocean or wherever it is that we think our animals are going to swim. And this thing listens for those pings. Uh, so the, um, the distance is about two kilometers, it's about, so it's about a half a mile or so that the tag needs to be close to a receiver, and then the receiver basically does a timestamp. So the receiver hears that tag, and it knows that's the tag, because it's a re unique radio frequency. It knows the date and the time that it heard. And so the idea is that you would have an array of these receivers covering the area. So ideally, we would have one of these every two kilometers along the entire south shore of Long Island. So that way, any if our, as our sharks swim back and forth, we would be able to sort of track them in time once we download the data off the receivers. So, okay, sounds good. Those, you know, so the acoustic, the, these acoustic tags, so the other tags are free, the first set. These are between 300, these are about three to $400 a piece, but the receivers are $2,500. So you, you can't really afford, you know, we would need a couple thousand of these things to cover the entire South Shore of Long Island at 2,500 bucks a piece. Oof, that's, a, that's a heck of a grant, you know? If anybody's willing to do that, I'm willing to take it. But, but the other thing is we've got to go out and physically put these down. We've got to physically lift them up. We've got to download the data. So there's a lot of work involved with, with getting it. But we can follow these animals in more real time and understand sort of where they go in between. The good news is that these tags and receivers are used by lots of people. So there's Stony Brooks has a grad student that's studying fluke. She's got the same receiver. So she might have five or six of these receivers out there that are going to hear our sharks if they swim by. Uh, another biologist is studying straight bass. So he's got a bunch of these receivers out there. So we're starting to cover pretty much a chunk of the South Shore of Long Island from all these different researchers. So we've got two now that we're able to put out. So we're contributing. And it's, it's, it's a consortium. So, you know, I don't know. I might. I know the tags, thank you. I know the tag numbers of my fish, and I can recognize them if I get any hits, but if I get all these hits from all these other tags, I just say, I don't know who they are, but I put them up on the website, and then everybody can look and see, or I can look and find out whose tags they are, and then directly send them to them, which is actually what we just did. We just got 6,000 data points from uh, one of the biologists that had his receivers out, so we're like super excited, just came in today. So by working together with other scientists to have these out there, we can, you know, we we're able to fill in a lot of gaps, but a lot of work, right? You got to go out, you got to damn download this stuff, you got to hound people to get the stuff. Um, but you do what you got to do, okay? This is a combo pack. So what we can do is, um, in addition to just giving. Um, uh, the pings if you follow the shark. So we, we can what we can do is we can put two tags in. So this one goes on the outside of the shark and gives us its uh, the um, uh, depth as well as temperature. If so, the hydro, the height the receiver only timestamps. So we just get I was here at this time of day. If we follow the shark with one of these directional hydrophones. Okay, the tags, those, those acoustic tags actually give more information in those pings. So, but you need a piece of equipment to be able to analyze that. So this is a directional hydrophone. So what happens is we would put um, a tag on the, on the outside of the shark, so we would get the depth that the shark is swimming at, we would get the temperature of the water, and we would know where it is based on because we're following it with the boat. We would put a second tag into his belly. 
And so things like white sharks, thresher sharks, mako sharks actually are able to retain some of their metabolic heat. So their body temperature is actually warmer than the water they're in, which gives them lots of advantages. One of the questions that's completely unknown is, what does that look like? It's never been done, and certainly in the North Atlantic, on these little white sharks here on Long Island. So what is the body temperature difference of a little white shark as it's hanging out on Long Island? Nobody knows. So that's one of the things we're super excited about. We just picked up, we've had the tags, and now we've got the hydrophone to be able to do that. So, so one of the things that we want to add to our rep repertoire for this year is to, is to put a tag in its belly and a tag on the outside, so, and then track them for at least 24 hours to get where do they go, what's that body temperature change difference, um, and we would be some of the first people to, to have that data. So what started out as, as a wild goose chase and trying to catch these white sharks has actually really started to, to pan out for us. You know, we're seeing that there's more of them here, um, and, and it's exciting because the work that we're doing is, is groundbreaking. So, so we're very excited about that. But again, a lot of work. You gotta follow the shark around. You're up for 24 hours. You have to have crews that switch on and off every three to four hours. You get smelly because I only have I don't have you know a bathroom on my boat. So um, so this is what it looks like. This is the directional hydrophone in the water. And so what it does is as you're following the shark, when you're when the hydrophone is pointed at the shark, it gets loud. So it, and as you move away, as you point away from it, it gets Quiet, so it might be like so that you know where where the shark is, and you can you can keep it um, you know keep hearing it. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get all that data and not have to follow them around for 24 hours? Technology is our friend, so we are uh, really actively trying to obtain. One of these, this is called a CATS cam. So CATS is capital C A T S, stands for Customized Animal Tracking Solutions. So what this does is it has a camera, high definition camera, as well as the different sensors that allow us to collect this data of depth and temperature and acceleration so we can know how fast the shark is swimming. And it also has sort of the same technology that's in your cell phone, so it knows if the shark banks or turns, it can count its tail beats. And you put this on its dorsal fin and walk away. And the tag stays on the shark with video for three to seven days, at which point in time during that time, the tag will release from the fish, float to the surface, I'll get an email saying, hey, I'm off and this is where I am. I'll get back in my boat, I'll go out with a VHF, doot, 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 and find it, download all the data, and we'll have literally a shark's eye view of where the shark went and, and all this data. So we can literally redraw in three dimensions how the shark swam through our waters, how it recovered after we let it go. So when we let it go, what did it do? It's recovering, did it lay on the bottom? I don't know. What did its body temperature do? Did it warm up? Did it cool down? I don't know. This tag, if we're able to acquire this tag, would give us all that information. And we don't have to be out there 24 hours. And you know, We could really only do like 24 to 46 hours because we run out of energy. The weather gets bad. We run out of food. I don't know. This thing stays with the shark until it pops off. So we're super excited. We've got a couple of um, opportunities You know that look, we're hopeful, is going to provide the funding to allow us to get this, but, um, you know, hopefully in, hopefully one of them will come through and we can have this. So we would add the uh, manual tracking and the CATS cam tracking for this summer. Um, the manual tracking we're absolutely doing, the CATS cam would be if, if we were able to secure the funding for that. These are the suite of tags that we have available uh, to us that we don't have to get out there and track them. So these are the satellite tags. The O-Search, the O-Search Shark Tracker, this is the tag that they use. So this is the tag that provides us the data on the, on the tracker. It gets bolted as high on the dorsal fin as possible. You see these two electrodes here? When it's under the water, current can complete a circuit that sort of shuts the tag off so it's not transmitting, burning a battery underwater. When the fin breaks the surface, this 
circuit is broken, which then turns on the transmission, and that's when it starts transmitting that data to the, to the satellite. So if the shark just comes up and down, uh, it may, we might, we'll hear, the satellite will hear, hey, here I am, but we won't get enough satellites to hear it to get our, to get our location. So that's sort of the issue that we're having. Um, these are, this is a, uh, all right, so this is a, a pop-off satellite tag. So what will happen here is uh, we put the, we put the tag in at the base of the dorsal fin, the tag stays with the shark recording the data that we want it to record, and then after a prescribed amount of time, maybe up to a year, there's a release, and this is a float, so the tag floats to the surface, wherever on the planet it is, and downloads the data to the satellite, the satellite then emails that information to us at the research, wherever, wherever we're at. So we don't have, we're, as long as the technology works, we're guaranteed to get the data back no matter where it is. These are $5,000 a piece though, so, you know, you get what you pay for though, you know, depending on what your question is, depending on what your funding source is, you know, we have a whole entire suite of different tags that can provide us that information. You know, you, you want to, you know, it's cheaper to put in your own sprinkler system, but you got to get out there and dig the hole. So that's sort of where the acoustic tags come in. Um, you know, if you have the money and just pay the guy, you know, it doesn't cost you a phone call. You know, that's sort of where these satellite tags come in. Um, it's also what question are you asking? If you're really interested in what they're doing here on Long Island, the satellite pop-off tag is not the tag for you. It gives you big, long-distance stuff. The acoustic tag is what you would want to do, even if you had you know, the, the big bank account. So, um, so that's that. Those are the tags that we have. Um, that's sort of how they work. Who cares, right? Like, who, who cares? Why? Why do we care about sharks? Pain ran away an hour. You know, she doesn't want to hear nothing. Well, there's lots of reasons, but I'm going to give you just one sort of ecological one that will hopefully leave you uh, feeling good. This represents uh, sort of population. Okay, so you got a lot of plants. Those little fish eat the plants, and you have sharks that eat the little fish. Okay, so this is the way it's supposed to be. Well, we kill all the sharks, or we we take down the shark population, right? So. You know, it's a good day to be a little fish, right? Because you're not going to have as much predation, so you're going to, you know, get more of them. But unfortunately, you have more little fish, the plants aren't going to be able to, to handle that, and so the whole ecosystem kind of falls out of whack. Um, and it's not sustainable. So the question is, where are, where are sharks' population on our, on our scale? We don't know until we get out there and start really looking at it. You know, Wildlife Conservation Society and us are, as far as I know, the only two organizations that are really focused on doing shark work here in Long Island. So that's one reason why you should care. Uh, what I can tell you from what we found, as I mentioned, the young of the year, the umbilical star. Okay, so this is an umbilical star on a, a sandbar shark right here. If Long Island was such a crappy, terrible, evil place, Full of pollution and dying and death, would these animals that have been around for hundreds of millions of years choose Long Island to have the most precious part of their life cycle? Right? And so most of the sharks that we're catching in close to the shore, which is where we fish, are all our young in the year. They have these umbilical scars, they're really small ones. So the sandbar sharks, uh, the dusky sharks, certainly the white sharks. Uh, so, and we're seeing more of them as we're out there. Uh, I don't have, I can't say scientifically and data proven, but just being out there, I'm catching more this year than I caught last year. I'm hearing more reports, more accounts this year than I heard the year before. So, from what we're seeing, uh, you know, Long Island's shark population is, is doing all right. So, with that, I'll 